And let's not panic that Steve's not here. Be- there he comes. <laughs> I was going to say, he and I practiced ahead of time. Oh, and it is very early on Wednesday morning for him. So we are all going to have to give him a round of applause for getting up this early and ready to present. Hi, Steve. Good morning. <laughs> You for, speak for Adrian, it's evening, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, late afternoon, but hey. Okay. Good, good afternoon, Aid. <laughs> yes, I know. Now, let's see. I've took my video on. See, I've, I'm dressed. All right. <laughs> Unlike Crystal, she's probably still in her jammies. At noon? I don't she, know. I see she's she's, she's 11. Oh, she told me that she often is. Yeah. It's the uniform of the day when you're working at home. (laughs) (laughs) Or retired. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've got my slippers on. (laughs) Crystal, that is is TMI. (laughs) Sitting there with just slippers. Oh, gracious. Oh, oh, well, more. A little more. (laughs) That's not quite what she meant, is it? Dwayne, it's nice to see you. Are you fit and healthy? Yeah, I'm doing really very well. So actually, uh, last uh, Thursday, my wife threw a surprise 70th birthday party for me. So oh. it was awesome in so many ways. A lot of good friends. A belated uh, happy birthday. Oh. Thought I'd share. Oh, I can't... Oh, it's out of focus, <laughs> whatever you've got written on your it arm. Fo- it got focuses and then said, nah. Is it, 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 it a Is it moving? <laughs> What does it say? Read. Can you bring it nearer, but keep it in focus? Well, I got to keep my head in there, too. There. Why don't you tell us what it says, Dwayne? Well, it's, it's, a, your it's, a, it's a cardiograph, which is a heartbeat uh-huh. with a flat line. Oh. And it's my rebirth, oh. my rebirth date. Oh. Wow. Oh, so you already died. 15... I actually died and was born again on that date. So absolutely, you're fifteen months old, aren't you, Dwayne? Oh, I'm like uh, no, I. <laughs> it's uh, I'm it's about ten months, uh, nine, yes. ten months old. Oh, is that all? I thought it was longer. And seventy, so. And yeah. you keep the fire station attached to you permanently, don't you? That all you the... know, there were. Ten EMTs within fifty feet. So otherwise, I would not be on this call or anywhere else above ground right now. So that's that is pretty nice. Supremely lucky. You were very yeah. fortunate. Yes, and also the lady that ran to your car and noticed you were slumped over at the wheel. Yeah, she actually was. A, my wife invited her to the birthday party. Good. So it, it was. It was amazing seeing her, and then today. Steve Chappell is going to talk about unraveling constraints, a case study. Steve uh, started not in an IT industry. Uh, He started with a different background and volunteered way back in 1994 to help manage enrollments for a conference he was involved in. And he used Access 1.0 to do such. And Since then, between now and then, he has moved full-time to access development, although, as I understand, that's a little not full-time anymore. He was an access MVP for a number of years, maybe 11, is that right, Steve? Starting with the year 2000. So we welcome him and go ahead. Very nice. Thank you very much. Um, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity to be with you people and greetings from New Zealand. I'm looking forward to this very much. I want to just give you a bit of a introduction to the approach that I'm taking here today. A few months ago, I think Maria mentioned the idea that it would be good in this user group to have some presentations relating to different ways in which access is used. It's always been one of the things that I've been fascinated about is learning about the many different ways in which access is used, the different industries. You find out that, you know, people have done applications in managing manufacturing processes or library loaning processes or or many different things. 
sports competition management, for example, which is what I myself have specialised in, let's say. Partly my motivation for being here today is to go, okay, this is just an idea, get to give people a, an idea, an interesting idea about a particular way in which access has been used. And uh, secondly, of late, within that, we've had a learning experience for me, which I wanted to sh share about. So this is primarily like a story. I'm telling you a story. We're not going to be getting too much into nitty gritty, how to use access to do such and such a thing, or looking too much at code. We will be looking a little bit at code and a little bit at some technical concepts that I were that were new to me and I think that probably may be new to some of the people here and then again on the other hand I apologize in advance if what I'm going to be talking about is a bit too basic for some of you bright sparks having said that let us go on to the story a while ago one of my customers that runs sports competitions for primary school children approached me and asked me if we could incorporate into our program the facility, the functionality to run a certain type of event. So this is a very specific type of event, an event where you have a number of participants. Let me just explain as I go through some of the you know terminology that I'm using here, because a participant in this context can be an individual person or it can be a team or a, a class or a group or whatever, right? And those participants are going to be attending a number of activities and those activities can be a large number of options, sports competitions, sports, sports type of activities or any other sorts of activities. It can be skill development program or a experience of just playing a game or whatever. So it's very, very broad and open-ended. At the moment, we're focusing on doing this for children to give them the experience of being active, being participants into group activities. It's a wonderful thing to be involved in, to be promoting the growth and development and learning of uh, young children. So I'm very passionate about that as well. So let's go here in our capacities. Some of the activities that the people are participating in, you can have the ability to have more participants than others. So the activities can have a definition of how many participants they can have. And then we have a set of, they call it rotations, it means sessions or time slots where they involved in, a group of activities, each participant in a different activity, and then at the end of the rotation, they move on to another one. So in a very simple scenario, it's very easy to just do that. They just go around in a circle. But when you start to get into a more complicated thing, it becomes more complicated. So I was tasked with this, build an application that will create a schedule for such an event where the program will allocate participants to each activity for each rotation and it has to meet certain criteria. Obviously, a participant can only do one activity at a time and then during the overall event, they're moving from one activity to another such that they're going to be each participant does each activity during the event and then that we also avoid combinations of participants in different activities. So when I heard this, I thought to myself, often being an overconfident person, and I think that this might apply to some of the present company, no worries. I'll have this done by the end of the week. It should be a piece of cake. I'm very excited, very interesting. And I thought no problem whatsoever, which I soon found out was way off. In fact, I've said to some people that this was the wrongest I've ever ever been in the whole of the time that I've been involved in software. Let me just give you a bit of an indication of the 
type of problem. So here is an example. This is a very, very simple example. It's way, way simpler than any of the actual real life events that we would ever be wanting to manage. But here's an example where we've got four activities, four time slots, four rotations, and eight participants. So let's say we're just doing this manually. So we go into here, we put participants A. This is a common thing in sports management. You get the first and the last and put them together, and then the second and the second to last, put them together. So we got A and H, B and G, C and F, D and E. We put those those pairings of participants in those four activities for the first rotation. Then we go down to the next rotation. So in the first slot here, we can't put A or H because they're already done that activity. So let's go B. Okay, so we put B in there. We can't put G because G's already been paired with B. So let's go F. Okay, we put F and so on. And we put them through and we've completed the allocation for the second rotation. No worries. Go to the next rotation. Let's go putting these in. We just put go, okay, what goes next? Let's try this. Let's try that. We put C and D. We put F and H. We get to the third activity and we put in participant A. And then who's going to be there with participant A? It has to be either B or G because they're the, the only three that haven't been already taken is B and G and E. And A and E have already been together, so that can't be E, so blah, 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 right? So we're going to put A, and we're going to put either B or G in activity three for rotation three. And that means that participant E has to go in activity four. It's the only place they can go. But it, it breaks the rule because participant E has already done activity four in the first rotation. So, done. Ah, oh dear, what do we do? Start again. We have to go back and start again. All right, anyway, just to show you that, that it's possible. It's actually very, very easy. I'm sure most of us here will be able to very quickly do this manually and get a valid answer uh, for this particular configuration, this particular pattern of combinations of activities and rotations and participants four four eight i call it and we've got success all right so i go okay how am i going to create a compliance schedule for any given configuration i want to be able to just you know generate this and some of these configurations can be quite complex much more complex than that one that i've just used in the example okay no worries I'll do this in VBA, like, you know, as there's this tendency to go, oh, yeah, 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 access can do everything, access can, we do, you know, whatever, access can do anything. This is just for my own purposes, just to try things out. I made a little access database and I have set up a configuration. This particular one is for six rotations with seven activities four of those seven activities have three participants and three of the uh, the other three act activities have two participants don't worry about the nitty-gritty details but that's the kind of concept so that means that there's going to be 18 participants we set that up we click the create schedule button and it goes through one after another, trying this, trying that. We're up to 10 trials and we've got to the 11th. So the 11th iteration of the code, it's come up with a valid schedule. This is the first rotation down to, down to here. Activity one has three and it's put in participants E, A and M. Activity 2, C, I, and L, etc., and it's gone down and put the participants into all of those activities 
for all of those rotations and it meets the rules. I'll show you just out of interest how I did this. This is the code that ran that procedure that we just saw. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a number of record sets, record set for the rotations, record set for the participants, for the activities, and we're doing a nested record set kind of structure. The purpose of me showing you this isn't to go, oh, what, you know, this code is like a, something that I can teach you about. I'm sure that this is a very straightforward kind of process in, in, in a way. We looped through the record sets within each other, like a, a nested record set. We go to the first rotation. It's just like the, exactly the same we did with the manual process. You put it in, the next one goes in. If it meets the rule, it's okay. If it doesn't meet the rule, you try the next one. If it doesn't meet the rule, you try the next one until you keep going, until you run to a point where there are no other options available and you go back and start again by randomly sorting the data again and starting again and doing it with another ordering of the data. So we go, you know, the participants, we go first, we're going through through the participants. And anyway, I don't want to go into this into too much detail, but just to give you the, the concept of what I was doing. Now, here is the process. With that little database, that little application, you just, you can go and then look in the, it'll print it to the immediate window and show you what is produced for you to just have a look at. And that's all very nice. Now, I'm sure there is a situation where I had a complex configuration for an event where that code didn't work. Well, I didn't know whether it didn't work because it was impossible, it was actually like actually mathematically impossible to get a solution for that particular configuration or whether I just didn't run the code often enough. To be honest, there were times where I got a valid compliant result for a schedule for an event after over 70,000 iterations of my code. So the first 70,000 and something got stuck because they couldn't, it got to a point where it couldn't do it anymore and eventually it got one after 70,000. So I'm going, ah, well, and th this is obviously, there's a problem here. Have I reached the ability of my skill ability? Or has I, have I reached the ability, uh, these, the limit of accesses or VBAs? Or is there another way of doing this? And so what I did then was I asked my friends. I went to uh, one of the MVP uh, discussion forums. I went to the Access D discussion forum. I went to another access-based discussion forum. I went to a business networking group that I belong to and talked there to some people that are as involved in the AI industry and, a, and to an engineer. And what I found that there were lots of people, seriously, lots of people who I regard as much smarter than I am, who initially had the same r response that I had to this problem, which was, Oh, yeah, no worries. I'm a bit busy today, but I'll get back to you tomorrow and show you how to do it. Or, you know, <laughs> or, or and thinking because it looks so easy. And I suppose some of you who are sitting there listening to this talk at the moment might be thinking to yourself, oh, yes, there should be a way to do this. We can, you know, figure out a, a good way to do this. And uh, or some of you might actually be familiar with this vista, I've called it, of knowledge that I had no idea existed until I got into this. And so if anybody's got any uh, great ideas about how we could do this, 
in uh, in access i'd be interested to hear uh, but all of these people that i asked who said yes we can do this and we'll get back to you and we'll discuss it all of them either stopped communicating with me or came back to me and said uh no sorry i thought i would be able to do it but i can't which was very reassuring to me it made me at least feel that i wasn't <laughs> the dumb boy in the room but in the end a lot of people had the same problem as me sorry it it isn't going to be an easy thing this type of problem applies to a number of different scenarios there's lots and lots of different scenarios there's some listed on the screen at the moment i found out about them i found out about a whole lot of technologies all of the words that are written onto the screen at the moment i had never heard of before and now i've at least read and become slightly familiar with many of these technologies and i've also found that there are a large number of tools that have been developed to solve this type of problem in different industries and with different requirements and so once again i've had a look at quite a few of those at this point i would also like to just mention i know jack's here today the extensive assistance that i received that jack drawbridge was the person who stuck with me through this we had some good conversations and he was very wonderful in being involved with me in learning about these these things it was a big learning experience from him, him as well i think that's true to say jack and as it was for me my learning in this area was definitely enhanced by the involvement with jack so that was fantastic jack if at the end of this presentation you've got anything you want to sort of pipe in and and say and contribute to this conversation that would be absolutely awesome mate okay so we come up with this thing we keep seeing it finding this word constraint satisfaction problem i'd never heard of it before some of you may have never heard of it before this concept constraint satisfaction programming constraint satisfaction algorithm and these things on the right hand side there there a lot most of those are constraint satisfaction solvers involving an assignment of fixed sets of data to a set of variables restricted by a set of rules that define valid allocation that's it some of these solvers uh, have soft approaches for example they are able to accept outcomes that don't meet the criteria don't meet the rules for example you're doing school timetabling you can go okay well we can still have a chemistry class on friday afternoon but it can't be in the laboratory in my case we needed to have it strictly meet the criteria or it was regarded as an invalid solution so we needed a constraint satisfaction algorithm and i had some options these are my options persevere with access i kind of concluded that it wasn't possible to do this in vba not that i'm a absolute you know gun in vba compared with some of my uh, colleagues but nevertheless i decided that pursuing that wasn't going to be productive could i learn enough about those constraint satisfaction tools and that technology to be able to do a good job of solving it myself no i, I was going to be too big a learning curve i decided abandon the project i didn't want to do that i don't like abandoning projects find someone else to do it for me that's what i did i chose option number 4 i went to a freelancer site i went to a number of freelancer sites and i found somebody who was ready willing and able to take it on in fact he was very wonderful to work with he was very interested in the project he had never seen microsoft access <laughs> believe it or not he didn't even know what i was talking about but he wrote something using python and leveraging the power of a solver or tools it's part of google so it's a google owned and developed tool 
for solving this type of problem, and he used Python to access that. Here is what we end up with. We run it in the command prompt. We could have had a nicer user interface to use this, but I'm the only person that's ever going to be using it. I'm happy to just do the kind of rough and ready. We uh, just run it in the command prompt. It goes through a process. This is the code that this particular guy's written, and there it is. It's come up with a solution exactly with that same configuration that we used before, seven activities, six rotations, capacity of three for the first four activities, capacity of two for the other th three, and he's come up with an answer there. And that code writes the data to a CSV file. It's just a big, long list. It's just the same data, just put in a CSV file. Simple. Now, back to the original application requirements. So we're going to generate a schedule for the defined co configuration. It's, it's absolutely not an option to pr present this to an end user and get them to use that constraint satisfaction tool. First of all, even if we could do a nice user interface and plug it into an access application and whatever we might do, sometimes these solutions take a long time, half an hour, whatever, to actually come up with an answer, and we can't do that. So basically, we decided to do this. I am going to create a solution for all of the possible and requested event configurations and regard those as a template. So however long it takes me to do it, that's all right. I'm going to then put it into access into my access application that the end user is going to use. So I guess the point with this is that solving that problem of how to create those templates is only a small corner of a big pie, which is providing an application that people can use to run a particular type of event there's a lot of different parts to it, and this part of the problem, this part of this slice of the pie of creating the templates is just a small part of it, but it's an essential part of it. Without that, nothing else can work. So once again, this is just to show you how simple it is, really. Once we got those CSV files, I just wrote this code here. We link to the CSV file in access we import it into an access table easy peasy so everything was easy peasy except for this problem right this is what it looks like in access the template file we just have a once again it's just like a whole lot of numbers i'm sure that this is elementary stuff for most of us here we have this as a lookup table which is going to get used by our application. Now, from the end user point of view, we're going to set up a situation here where we're having the end user can create an event. They can assign values to the configuration variables. They can apply one of these templates to it. They can generate a schedule and they can output the schedule in a number of ways. If you like, I will just quickly give you a bit of a look at what that looks like. Here is my practice test copy of my sports runner application, which does a lot of work running all sorts of different sports competitions, league competitions, tournaments, and so forth. And this particular type of functionality comes here under Carnival. We call it the Carnival. We've already set up a carnival. I called it the lunchtime demo in honor of this particular event. This lunchtime demo just has one section. There is six. So it's the same configuration as we've been using for other examples. We've got six rotations. We've got 
seven activities. This is the capacity. So these three activities have capacity of two. These four activities, capacity of three. We have 18 participants that have already been entered in here. The end user, who is a sports manager of some sort at an organization that runs events for people, comes to here and is going to check to see whether there's a template available. It tells them that there's an available template. There's the template. They assign that template to their event. Then what they do is they go here, they click a button, generate the carnival schedule for the event. Oh, that's right. There's already one. Overwrite it. Yes. Event schedule successfully generated. This is what the schedule looks like. They can look at it in two ways for each participant. In this case, these teams. It shows them their schedule, which activity they are doing at which time and which day. Then we can look at it another way as well for each activity, which two participants or teams are doing that activity. These are two, 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 three, three, three. It's exactly the same data, just looked at from another angle. We can print it out, let's say, in a number of formats. We can look at that as a event schedule listed by rotation, that particular rotation. So this particular report would be given to the person that's that's running the event, or we can look at it according to, I won't do them all, I won't do it all, but there's the one for the participants and shows that would be sent to them. In fact, we can email it to them. We can send them an activity-based schedule. It pulls out the email addresses of the people that are involved in the competition, sends them an email, and they get that as a PDF file. I'll just cancel that out of there because I'm running out of time and I'm just about finished. I'm going to say now what we do then is hit this button here, upload the active schedule to the website, click that button, done. It's uploaded the data to a, a website. That website, there it is, shows the schedule once again for these are the activities, these are the seven activities. These are the participants that take place in that activity in this time slot, and we can select another time slot and see what they're doing, or we can look at it from the point of view of the teams and see that this team fiddlesticks at 9 o'clock on the 29th is doing dodgeball, and then at 10 o'clock they do this and so forth. So this is where... The people, the schools, the participants, the parents, whatever, will be using as a reference point to look at what is happening with this particular type of event. So that's just giving you a bit of an overview of the way in which this functionality has been applied and used. And as it happens, last Friday we had the first event that was run through this software in real life. Uh, there were about 350 children, primary school children, at a big park. I went down there and had a look, and it was absolutely terrific and very gratifying to see and knowing that they knew which place that they were going to be in because of a report that came out of my application. So there we go. I've finished. Thank you very much for your attention. I um, hope that you found that of some interest. And I'd be very happy now for us to have any further discussion or see if any questions or any ideas about that. Thank you very much. If you want to re-enable your video, unmute yourself, or put questions in the chat, I already saw a nice comment from Adrian. Do you want to repeat that comment for Steve's benefit. He probably didn't have time to watch the chat while he was talking. 
So Steve, this is a, a just a comment I put in. Essentially, then create a whole bunch of different templates using various criteria patterns where you have the number of bloody blah actions and do what. Load these templates into the database such that the details are stored in one or more tables and use this data for any situation where these types of assignments are required. If any criteria pattern is not already stored, then another run of the outside Python software is required to specify and produce that new criteria pattern and thus allow the database again to work for that new pattern. As usual, Adrian, you have been a master with words. I'm going to take what you just said and I'm going to put it in a brochure and send it out to my potential customers for this. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So that, that is, you're absolutely 100% spot on. I'm very pleased that you've been paying attention. <laughs> that was what I understood from what you were you were absolutely, showing. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Adrian, you did a great job so then, good. Steve. Adrian, yeah. so good at encapsulating everything. Steve, very nice presentation. Great graphics. I want to figure out how to iterate with VBA, but even though I have the interest, I don't have the time. And I was hoping Jim would do it. Nice that Python works, though. Thank I, I'm you. just sorry, Chris. So you're just short of about seven lifetimes of time to do it in. <laughs> so I, I, I do have. Oh, I sorry. do have a link here that I'm going to post that Mike Wolf, another MVP, had a problem that was at least similar to this. I don't know that it was the exact problem, but he had a nice five-part series. They're short series about this type of a problem and how you might do it with code. And even at the end, some kind of a SQL-based solution, which I believe is using some SQL techniques that are more advanced than what we can get in VBA. Maybe not exactly what your Python did, but I think something worth it to explore as well, if this is something you're trying to look into. So really the power of that tool that we ended up using isn't really got to do with the power of Python. That was just the language that this particular guy was familiar with. It was the power of the OR tools yeah. that yeah. Google developed software. That particular thing from Mike Wolf, I think one of the things I learned from looking at that was he's got a table, I think, somewhere where you could go, if you've got these many variables, then the number of iterations, the number of permutations of the, the way those variables fit together goes into the billions. Very, very quickly, it goes into the billions. And I, I was absolutely, I, you know, I mean, some of some people that are real kind of clued up with mathematics, I guess, would be not surprised by that. But I was surprised by that. What you're trying to find is basically, and I spoke to Mike about this, and he, he said what you're really doing once you get to some of these more complicated scenarios is you are looking for a needle in a haystack because we are getting billions of possible permutations and only a few of them are actually going to meet your rules. So that's good. I see Jack's got his microphone. Yeah, um, I do. I could just make a few comments if I can. I've been a, an Access D member as long as Steve probably, and I saw his question there. And I, as he said, I saw a number of people who have a lot of respect for say, "Oh, yeah, it should be easy," but it wasn't. I tried. It. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do any of it. I asked a friend of mine, I see Colin has asked a question, did you talk to Major Pete? Well, I did. I didn't understand what the problem really was. Like, why was it so different? So I asked this guy who was a real mathematics guy on our other one of the other forums. And he says, oh, you're into a whole new thing of constraint programming, constraint, constraint optimization, constraint satisfaction. He says, you'll find that you can go on for, for hours doing this. And then you find out you have to backtrack 
and start all over again. It's just one of those things. So I said, well, is there anything out there? He says, well, go to one of these other forums. I went to Stack Overflow or something with uh, constraint satisfaction, and it was terrible. My experience there was awful. It's, well, why are you coming here? If you've got homework to do, do it yourself. I'm going, okay, this is not the right group. So I started going to YouTube, and I found a thing on MiniZinc. I'd never heard of MiniZinc. I'd never heard of Constraint Satisfaction Program. But once I started going to some MiniZinc that were from the University of Melbourne, and there's various people involved. Anyway, what I found was there's all kind of tutorials out there, and it's all based on an old Chinese boring factions with how many men they had how much money they had, how many swords they had, and they had to come up with optimizing their battle plan. And this is how they introduced this whole constraint satisfaction thing. Anyway. So Jack, Jack, can you spell that? Is it mini sync? M-I-N-I zinc, Z-I-N-C. Now, mini, okay. just Thanks. let me just finish here just for a second. I started reading a bunch of stuff. And I started getting some facts. I started working with a few little things. And I was working on Steve's initial problem, as I saw it, which was four activities, four rotations, and eight teams, eight teams of two. So I had a very small, minimal thing. And I looked at it and tried it. And I even went to, as I was having all kinds of syntax problems with many things, it's, it's different. But I went with Bing Chat, I went with Chat GPT, and what I found was the answers there were awful. You go around, and the first thing it does, it sends you over to, oh, maybe you should be using Python. And you go down that stream for a little while, then it goes back, well, have you tried ManyZing? Well, it's the same conversation. Of course I've tried ManyZing. Anyway, I worked at it, the simple problem, and I finally solved it. But what I found was that you have to lay out a bunch of facts, which are basically, these are the, the rules. And then there was a number of constraints. And MiniZinc is nothing more than sort of an assembler that puts these statements into some pseudo language, if you will, that you can pass off to various solvers. And one of the solvers was Aura Tools, which Steve had mentioned to me, and I said, well, that's interesting because MiniZinc can use Aura tools. MiniZinc can use about seven or eight of these uh, solvers to go through these things. But just in the same general thing here, the knapsack problem that we hear about sometimes, like some robber comes into the house, they got a knapsack that can carry, say, 10 pounds, and they got all these different articles they could steal. Each one's worth a certain amount of money, and each one weighs a certain amount. What's the best stuff to put in your knapsack so it doesn't break, but it's worth the most money? The same kind of satisfaction problem. Another one was the traveling salesman. Another one was, Steve mentioned, was shift scheduling or hospital scheduling. Well, his is games and routine scheduling. And the other one I thought was quite interesting was you have a certain amount of money and you're a political organization and you're trying to determine the best location for, say, three or four fire stations or hospitals or whatever, so that they serve most people with a minimal amount of costs. Again, constraint satisfaction problem. So it was very interesting. But this mini zinc was free. It's easy to download. It's a pain in the ass to learn the syntax. And I haven't. I stopped when Steve said, <laughs> oh, I've... I've think I've got a solution. I said, well, I've solved your four by four, but I haven't even looked at the other stuff. And I looked at that from October to December before I had a, a solution. And even then I had to get somebody on one of the forums to help me move it from just a whole bunch of ones and zeros back into, again, mini zinc is a whole different thing. But, but they do have sessions each year and i've mentioned this to steve too they have these tournaments but the thing is is that the aura tools has been winning all these tournaments for the last i don't know, say four or five years 
So there's a lot of competition. It's a whole different set of mathematics. The kind of problems are all different, but it was quite interesting and it was a great learning experience. And I really think Steve did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. We do have Colin with his hand up. Do you? Hi, uh, Steve. Ahead? I'm an ex teacher, and for many years I was the school timetabler. So I'm well familiar with the complexities of this sort of approach. And my very first, and this is a how easy can it be, back in 2005, my very first public database was to sort out an enrichment week timetable, 1,200 kids, 150 activities, and a week to fit everything in as best as possible. And I came to the conclusion my skill level was much worse than it is now, (laughs) uh, or maybe just as bad as it is now, but I got to about, the best I could ever hope to get to was about 90% of the way there. And it was the same with school timetabling commercial programs. You get almost all of it done, and then you stop at the best solution, and the rest you fit in by hand. I never managed to do the last bit there. So well done to what you achieved there. It's very impressive. Jack mentioned earlier, I put a private message to him, at Access World Forums, there's a very highly skilled programmer called, well, he uses the nickname Madge P. I don't know if that's how you should pronounce it. His real name is Peter, wonderful surname, Peter Popper. And he is going to be giving a talk to the Access Europe group in August on tri- working with tree views. But he specializes in hierarchical problems and constraint problems. And he would be superb. He would love to work on something like this purely in access, I guarantee he would say, yes, it's difficult, but yes, I will do it, and he will do it. So I seriously suggest that if you want to take this any further, I'm happy to get in touch with him. And as I say, in August, he'll be speaking to Access Europe. He did say, interestingly, I said, do you want to talk about some of these complex mathematical problems you've done? And he said, no, I think I'll do something with a wider audience. These problems are great. I love doing them, but frankly, they are. Each of them has a very limited scope. I think he's underselling himself, but still, which is not like he normally is. He was on another form. I saw him there ten or fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. He was very good there too. All right. So I think Crystal had her hand next, and then Jim, you're after her. Thank you, Maria. Steve, thanks so much. Lots of good ideas. And I love all the extra stuff that everyone else is adding. And a question. Would you please say your last name so we know how Uh, to pronounce it? Maria got it right. A lot of Americans want to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. In fact, it's Shapel, like you pronounce it like Apple, not like Propel. Good to know. She told me like Apple. <laughs> and I, okay. have one, I have one more comment. Jack, thanks for passing on your research and knowledge. That was very interesting. I still think VBA can do it. And maybe Jim has a comment about that. So you're next, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks. I just wanted to say, Steve, hats off to you for sticking with it and delivering an application to your client. Uh, What an effort, and Jack as well. I did come up with a solution for your initial problem off the MVP group, having a predefined matrix and just applying the participants to it. And what I was exploring was generating those matrices automatically so that you wouldn't have to go through all the iterations because you proved me very wrong very quickly that cycling through things was probably not the way to go. The only other little thing is I saw in your code you were randomizing a sleep to try and stall things a bit, I think. You might want to explore using DB Engine idle with DB flush cache option. That lets the jet or ACE database engine catch up and do all its processing and you can be sure when that statement's done executing that all your record sets are refreshed and ready to go and have current data so rather than just sleeping 
and hoping that it's going to clear it up. Do that. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Yeah, we. I know we had a good conversation about this early on, but the reason I used that sleep actually was not because of that purpose. To be honest, it was because the randomising process uses the timer. I found that if I didn't stagger it, then the random it was going too quick, and the randomising wasn't actually happening because it was already like the, the timer wasn't hadn't moved on enough or mm -hmm. something so i was putting in a tenth of a, a second between them just to help with the randomization process and while i've got the floor again i see in the chat that my friend Dwayne has not been happy with my pronunciation <laughs> of the word schedule <laughs> so we're okay uh, we're good bud yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's all kind of <laughs> uh, okay, Mister Scapel. I <laughs> don't start calling me shrapnel. That's all. <laughs> Dwayne's uh, still working on his pronunciation. You understand? Yeah. He's still and, learning. I also say database. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I'm always surprised that my British friends don't say database it seems to me that I, th I mean i just assumed that that was that was part of the british way of speaking you know but no, um, that's an antipod thing steve we we, we speak proper you speak proper yes i knew aussies and kiwis aussies and kiwis always say database it's not something you'll find in britain very much oh dear that's so disappointing yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Well, I tell you what I can say. I can I can pronounce pronounce chapel because it's like where you go down and have a church, isn't it? Almost. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. This has been fascinating, everybody, and thank you for your <laughs> contributions. I myself will not be able to attend the April meeting to maybe hand that off to Crystal or something like that. I've got a trip planned for. I'll actually be in an airplane during the time, so I can't even do it from a different location. If you do have something that you've done in access, that's cool. Like Steve was showing us here today, or, you know, it doesn't have to be like this, but something that someone might be interested in. He didn't go into a lot of technicalities, told us about the problem, about his application. Think about it. Be happy to have you. In May, we are going to have George Young talk about using web APIs from Access. So we look forward to that. And then we'll take a break for the summer. We'll take a break for June and July and start up again at the end of August. So everybody, please give a big round of applause for Steve for sharing your... Inside from us today. Good job. Very nice. Thank you. Anyone else joining in British summertime? Oh, you got it wrong, <laughs> didn't you, Neil? Oh, um, I don't believe it. The number of times that happens to be in the spring. Well, I'm sorry about that. Have, have uh, you guys not switched time zones yet? No, not till next, next weekend. weekend. Next weekend. Okay. We rely on the time buddy thing to tell us. Yeah. Yeah. So see, I, actually, that's me being thoroughly smug. I didn't at all. I relied on Crystal reminding me, which <laughs> she did. And I'm thus and only thus able to make it in time. I'm sorry. I probably <laughs> should have oh, mentioned oh, that. Crystal, will you put me on my list for next year, please? In the emails. So, sorry. Uh, Neil, though, nice to see you. How many people are going to the virtual DevCon here in a couple of weeks? They're already at 100, Adrian, so you might want to check it out. He will cap it at some point. Do you guys have hands up or are you still clapping? Colin, Ben, T. Jacoby, do you guys want to talk? I think what they're doing is they're putting the hand up and then down again. Yeah. It's like exercise. Hand. It was to Just say we're going once. to DevCon. Yeah, you asked about DevCon. So yeah. The oh, they're putting it up for that. Got it. Yep. Got it. Got it. Sorry. 
Is there anyone that's fooling around with the, that new basic language? Do you mean twin basic? Twin yeah, basic. twin basic. Yeah. Mike is, um, Mike Wolf, obviously, is very keen on that. Fafaloni, whose real name I've forgotten, is probably the person who's used it the most and does some wonderful things with it. But it's it's beyond the level I want to go. Yeah, I think they were hoping for a lot more integration with Access, and that it would yeah. be a companion and give you more tools in the toolbox to use yeah. with Access. So that's why I think it keeps coming up. And, you know, obviously, they've come light years in the, just the past couple of years of development, and it's constantly changing. Crystal? Wayne Phillips, who's writing Twin Basic, is absolutely brilliant. He's amazing. But I see Twin Basic as our future. You know, right now he's building things. What if Microsoft just stops supporting access? How are we going to support all these access databases that are out there? And I hope that Microsoft continues supporting access and VBA, although VBA really hasn't gotten any changes in a long time. But we all depend on it. And this is like the backup plan. Is it a backup? Is there any reality that anyone can imagine whereby Twin Basic ends up being what we get to use? I don't imagine there's anyone here that would say, you know, Twin Basic just doesn't do it as far as its technical abilities is concerned. It's the fact, and I say that in quotes, the, the concept, the idea that actually it'll never be what you use when you're working with BASIC unless you buy it separately. And that then isn't the main market. It's a niche. It's like a tributary, not a tributary, a side stream. Brilliant as it is, and clearly brilliant as Wayne is, this is not going to take us forward. The main strength is its ubiquitous nature. That is, that it is used by so many people around the world. VBA, you don't go and buy a license to use VBA. It comes with access. It comes with Word. It comes with Excel. You already have it. I've just spent the afternoon automating com from access in the most advanced way, basically being able to send an email from the application, carry on with what you're doing. It remembers the email. It sets up an event listener. And then when the user finally finishes editing it, which may be later on that afternoon because the phone rings, it will then grab the event of it being sent and update the database to show that the email has been sent. I can't imagine doing that with the new Outlook through any API that they might imagine. That's something where COM is the only way to be able to do it at the moment. And it's only because it's got a full and complete object access model and the COM integration of the events going to and fro that you can even do that type of thing. Do you need do you need COM to enable you to be able to see the Outlook object model? COM is it's the reference. It's through COM by opening the object model. It's a create object. Create object gives you the object model of the application, and that is that COM. Can. Create object will grab an open instance and give you the object model. Create object is that word, yeah. is the mechanism I, of reading the object that. model of the other application. And that is calm through and through. Yeah, that's calm. And, 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 and what they're talking about is killing that off. And if they kill that off, the apps would just not be able to talk to each other anymore. So in any if, way, are you saying you need calm for seeing any of the other libraries that you have referenced? It's the reference. Calm is the reference. Oh, you are saying that. Oh, fair enough. The actual COM interface is the reference. What you're calling a reference is the COM interface between the two. Oh, what I'm calling a reference is where you have in, in your VBA window, yeah. you have a list of references, don't you? Yeah, you those are COM interfaces. VBA. Those are and a list of COM rely on com. I'm not yeah, telling you, I'm asking you. I'm, not, <clears throat> I'm just clarifying so that my thinking is up to date. My so, understanding uh, is that they are a list of COM interfaces. Right. References list itself is a list of COM interfaces. It's the I interface that is COM. That's what the that COM would, is. And that would make what you say make absolute sense. Now, what they'd have you do is go off to some web server somewhere to talk to some app. Well, hang on a sec. I don't want to go via a web server to talk to 
an adjacent application running on my PC, yeah, I'd rather go straight to it through the existing interfaces that they're trying to kill off. Well, no argument there, Neil. <laughs> yes, Ben, you're muted, so don't forget to unmute. Yeah, I'll unmute. I was just curious if there's a a live chat group, like a, a Discord or something for access developers. And I know a lot of you guys from following your stories or talking with you, and there's times I want to just be able to ping you and say, hey, what do you think of this or whatever? And I don't really know if there's a... Join us for our next Access Lunchtime meeting on Tuesday, April 30th at 12 p.m. Central Time. We will learn how to chat with other Access developers on Discord with Jim Detman and Doug Udovic. Explore what has been set up so far, get general advice on how to use the Discord platform, and learn how you can interact with other developers in a modern voice, video, and chat environment. It should be educational, and this is something that other Access developers have requested a platform to be able to chat with other developers. And so it's, it should be very exciting. Please join us. Use Discord, and notably enough, Twin Basic is a Discord channel. Yeah. And there's lots of access subs out there. Right. The, um, um, the org list server acts like that. It's, a, it's an email system rather than a chat system, but that works in that way, although it's a, it's a UK membership. I've recently joined that and found it's very effective at getting to high class developers when you've got a real issue, as long as you don't sort of bug them with little things. I believe the UK Access User Group is open to non physical people who are would not <laughs> be able to get <laughs> foreigners. Non physical people, what are they? <laughs> You could be a member who turns up to online meetings, and there are some of those. There are also physical meetings, in-person meetings. There yeah. are several non-UK people, I think is what Adrian, in his unique way, was trying to say. <laughs> um, Armand Stein is a member. Anders Zebro is a member. And I'm sure there's others as well. But are definitely not non-physical people. <laughs> not, not, in that, not in that sense, no. <laughs> I'm just going to say it out loud. Every time I see Adrian, I'm always looking over his shoulder to see if there's an old Commodore or an old Apple II on his desk. <laughs> no, I didn't have any Apple stuff. It's all, oh, uh, no, I've, it does go back pre-PC, pre some of it. Um, but, no, it's all, it's mostly DOS and Windows stuff, software and other rubbish. You do have a very interesting desk. <laughs> and, it's, in, and I like it when you don't blur it. Oh, I forgot. Public I meetings. Like blur, fair enough. Yeah. I no normally I blur it for public meetings and don't for when I'm having private meetings. But I forgot today, so no worries. No worries. This is where we just find out it's actually a custom zoom background from the retro package. <laughs> from the from that museum up in Bletchley Park. <laughs> Uh, oh, hang on. That's much better. You're all blurry. It's <laughs> That's better. It's all in the background of blurry you. It's much better. You do that, Maria. Adrian is part of the background, anything. really. He's you not just, really I think you lean forward and steamed up the web app, <laughs> the, the webcam. Uh, Adrian has become a, a non-physical nice person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, yeah. sounds good. Great meeting, great meeting. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Cheerio. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, folks. <laughs>